Welcome to the first video of this course. In this video, we are going to learn how we can install the Kali Linux operating system on our machine. Now, simply go to kali.org and on this page, simply click on download. While we are at it, we must know that Kali is a Debian based Linux distribution that is developed for pen testing or penetration testing. Anyways, simply click on download and you would be brought to this page. Now, you can see that we get two different options for our Kali Linux. The first one is the bare metal in which you directly install the Kali Linux into your machine and the other version is a virtual machine version. In this you install the Kali Linux inside a virtual box simulator which can be VMware which can be virtual box and then install it while running your main or parent operating system. Now throughout this course we would be working with the virtual machine version for Kali Linux. However you might wonder what is the difference between the two. Well, if you directly install the Kali Linux inside your PC, then you get access to the internal Wi-Fi card, the internal GPU and so much more, even the Ethernet adapter. However, if you install it inside a virtual machine, you don't get the direct access to your Wi-Fi adapter or your Ethernet adapter or even your GPU. But since we have established that Kali is made for pen testing, which does not require that much of graphic use, so we can go with the virtual machine one. So simply click on virtual machines and then it is going to show you the different versions and the emulator that you want to use to run this virtual machine. Now I am going to go with the 64 bit architecture and for VMware workstation. So simply click on this arrowhead and download this Kali Linux inside your PC. And to run this we need a VMware. So we have two different options here as well. The first one is the workstation pro which is not free it is actually a paid version but it contains a lot of different options. And the other is a VMware workstation player. Now this is a free version. It is the same as workstation pro but it has far less options but it runs the same. It gives the same features so you have no problems with going with this one as well. Now once you have downloaded the Kali Linux and installed the VMware workstation then simply head inside the VMware workstation and you will get a similar interface to this one. In the workstation player you might get a different UI but that is totally okay. Well before creating a virtual machine inside this what we need to do is that we need to extract the image that we got from kali.org. So simply head inside the folder in which you have downloaded the Kali Linux and from here you want to extract it with either a 7-zip or WinRAR. Now once you have extracted it it is going to look something like this and if you open it it contains a lot of files but we are not concerned with any of them. So once extracted simply head back over to VMware and then click on Opera Virtual Machine and then simply choose the path where you have extracted your Kali Linux. So if I open this folder up I can only see one file instead of a lot of files. Now this file is specifically made for VMware so click on it and then click on OK or open. Now it is going to create this tab over here which is going to read as Kali Linux 2022.2. 22.2 is the version that we are going to work with throughout this course and on this page or on this tab you can see that there is some allocated space for memory and allocated processes you can change them according to your requirements. Now since my PC has 16 gigabytes of RAM therefore I'm going with 6 gigabytes of RAM for this virtual machine and 8 processors for this virtual machine. And also the thing is that you need to make sure that you have at least 80 gigabytes of storage available before installing Kali Linux. Once everything is set up, simply click on this button right over here or press this arrowhead icon over here to start or boot up the Kali Linux virtual machine. If you click on it, then you are going to be placed inside our virtual machine. Now as you can notice, my cursor disappears because now we are inside another operating system or inside a new VMware. To get out of this VMware or this virtual machine back to our parent VMware, back to our parent operating system, simply press Ctrl and Alt and your cursor would appear and you would be able to maneuver the parent operating system. Once it is loaded, it is going to show you this login page. Now by default, a credential account has been created with this image which contains the username as Kali and the password is Kali as well. So type those in and then click on login. And then you would be able to see this user interface for Kali. Anyways, if you want to maximize the screen of this virtual machine which is running our Kali operating system, then simply click on this button right over here. Now this is going to take this virtual machine into a full screen mode and if you want to exit from this full screen mode simply bring your cursor to the top of the screen and this bar is going to show itself and from here you can click on this button that is going to exit from the full screen. Again if you are inside a full screen and you want to operate or maneuver the parent operating system which can be Mac which can be Windows then what you can do is that you can press Ctrl and Alt and then your cursor would change. 
now this means that we are outside of this kali or this virtual machine now if i press windows d that is going to show me the desktop of my parent operating system anyways you are now set up with an installed version of kali running on your pc now in the next video we are going to talk about the user interface of this kali linux Okay, so we have installed the Kali Linux on our virtual machine. Now we can have a first look at our Kali Linux. So let's start from the top right. So we have at first this logout button, which is actually a power button from which we can restart, shut down and do a lot more power related settings. After that, we have this lock screen button. Pressing it would actually just lock up my user. So if I want to log in again, I need to click on it and then type in my credentials for the user, which is Kali Kali. After the lock screen button, we have our clock, the battery percentage because I'm running this on my laptop and then we have the notification. After that, we have the volume settings and then we have our Ethernet connection. Now, in case you are working with an external Wi-Fi adapter and you are connected to a Wi-Fi using that adapter, then this would be the Wi-Fi adapter over here rather than the Ethernet network connection. Now, these small lines that you see over here is actually the processes that are running or I should just say the usage of your CPU. So if I click on it once, this is going to show me my taskbar. Now I can see all of the processes that are being executed right now. Their process IDs, their RSS and the CPU usage. Anyways, this was the task manager. After that, we have these numbering 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now these numberings actually represent different displays of our virtual machine. So we can have four simultaneous desktops on this virtual machine and these desktops can have different applications running in them, sort of like different workstations. And then we have our terminal. Now this terminal is where we are going to be spending most of our time throughout this course. Linux operating system has a graphical user interface for everything but that is not that powerful as this terminal. So throughout this course we would be working with this terminal. This terminal is going to be our new home. So after this terminal we have ourselves the Firefox browser to browse the internet. After that we have this text editor which is used to take some simple notes and then we have our home directory which is home forward slash Kali and then we have this button that minimizes all of the applications so that we can see our desktop and then we are going to come to this Kali icon later. Now on the desktop we have this trash bin which is the same as recycle bin on windows and then we have the file system. Now file system is more like my computer on windows which displays all of your drives, files and everything. This is like a file explorer. But we are going to talk about file system in much more detail in the coming videos so we don't have to worry about that. But for now let's just say that this contains all of the different files directories included inside it. So this is where all of the data is managed inside our Kali Linux distribution. And then we have this icon, this folder icon that says home. So this is our home directory. Now this home directory is placed at home forward slash Kali. So we have our desktop, documents, download, music and so much more. Anyways, coming to this icon right over here, pressing this icon would show us all of the applications that have been installed in this Kali distribution. So these are the pen testing tools for different purposes and they are grouped in categories. So we have information gathering tools over here and then we have DNS analysis information, IPS identification and so much more. Then we have vulnerability analysis tools, web application analysis, database assessment, so much more. But everything is beautifully categorized so that finding a perfect tool for a perfect scenario is easy as pie. So anyways, that was the first look on our Kali Linux distribution. So in this section, we are going to talk about the basic commands for Linux operating system. And yes, I have said Linux and not Kali because these are the commands that can be used in any flavor of the Linux operating system. Now, I'm assuming that throughout this course that you have some kind of basic information or knowledge about the Linux operating system but even then I'm going to explain some of the basic commands so even if you are a newbie to Linux operating system or Kali you know how to work around the directories how to make files and how to do other stuff so we're going to start with the pwd command the very basic of all commands 
Now the PWD command actually stands for present working directory. So simply right click on any directory, it can be your desktop and open up a terminal. Now, as I've mentioned before in the previous video that we are going to be spending most of our time within this terminal. So in here, if you want to execute any command, you simply type in the command and hit enter. So in our case, our command is PWD. And if I hit enter, it is going to print me the full path or the complete path of the present working directory. Now what do we mean by present working directory? Basically, all of the commands that we execute within this terminal are going to be located inside this working directory. So suppose that if I have any file on my desktop and if I want to access it, I would have to be in that directory for desktop. So yes, that was the very basic command which is to find out the current working directory of your terminal. Now previously we talked about the present working directory and this time around we are going to talk about how to list all of the files and directories within a present working directory. So if I open up my terminal and type in the command ls which stands for list show and then hit enter, it is going to print me all of the files that I have inside a certain directory. But as you can see that I have nothing on my desktop so that is why it returns us an empty space. Now if I were to create a directory. Now as you can see that we have used two different commands to create two different types of files. Now we are going to cover these commands in the coming videos but for now we are simply going to type in the command ls and then hit enter. Now as you can see that it shows us that there are two types of file on the desktop. One is named as hello1 which has the color as white. This means that this is a file not a directory. And the other one is hello dir with the color blue. Now this means that it is a directory. When we are working inside a Linux operating system, each file and each directory has a certain set of permissions. Now we can also view those permissions using the ls command but for that we would have to add in a new flag so we type in ls space hyphen al. Now this shows us quite a lot of information. So the very first thing is that we have the permissions right over here. Well I'm going to explain them in a while and then we have the username of the user which has access to this file and then we have the group which has access to this file and then the time it was created and followed up by the name. If it is a single dot this means that it is a directory. If it is a double dot this means that you can go back to the home directory. Anyways if it has a name and it has a prefix of D this means that it is a directory file or if you are coming from windows it is a folder. And if it does not have a prefix of D, rather it has a prefix of hyphen, this means it is a normal file which can be executed or not, depending upon the permissions. After the directory or the file hyphen prefix, we have rwx, rwx and then rwx. Now the first R means that it has read privileges, the W means that it has write privileges and if it has X right over here then that would mean that it has executable privileges as well followed up by another set of RWX. So the very first set like this one would mean that it has privileges for the user then it would have privileges for the group and then it would have these privileges for other groups or other users. So that was the list show and list show with the AL flag in the Linux operating system. Now the next command is actually the cd command. Now cd command stands for change directory. So when you are working in the Linux file system, you want to head inside other directories and other files. To do that we have the change directory command. Well to use this command it is pretty straightforward. You simply type in the cd command and then the folder or directory that you want to head inside. And if you want to head to the previous directory or the parent directory of the present working directory, you would simply type in cd space a dot. And if you want to head over to the home directory or the root directory, you would type in cd space double dot. So let's see them in action. So as we are on the desktop right now, we are going to type in the command ls to show all of the directories that we have on the desktop and we had created this directory in the previous video. Now I'm going to head inside this directory by simply typing in the command cd followed up by the name of this directory which is hello dir and then hit enter. Now as you can see that the complete path to this directory is desktop slash hello dir. In case I want the complete path starting from the root, I would simply type in pwd over here. Now let's assume that we want to head inside the downloads folder which is placed at home slash kali slash desktop but we do not want to go through directories one by one. We simply want to head inside it in one go. We can do that as well by simply typing in the command cd space home space kali space downloads and then hit enter. And now as you can see that we are now inside the downloads folder. So that is how you can head inside or move around the directories in the Linux file management system.
Now in this video we're going to talk about the mkdir command. Now that command stands for make directory. Now starting from where we left in the previous video we are right inside the downloads folder but we want to create a new directory onto the desktop with the name as directory1. Now we can do that but first we need to change our present working directory to desktop. Now to do this we would use the change directory command which is cd type in home slash kali slash desktop. Now we are in the desktop and now we are going to create a new directory using the mkdir command. So if I type in mkdir and then the name of the directory that we want to create. So I'm just going to type it as dir1 which would stand for directory1 and then hit enter. Now as soon as I hit enter you can see that on the GUI this new folder has been created. Now in Linux operating system folders are known as directories, so we can say that this new directory was created using the mkdir command. And then we can use the cd command to head inside this directory so cd space dir1 and now we are inside the directory that we have just created. So that is how you can create directories using the mkdir command. The thing is that often times beginners get confused for make directory command and try to use them to create a new file. Now mkdir command can only be used to create directories or folders but not normal files or executable files. For that we have another command which we are going to cover in the next video. Now in this video, we are going to talk about the touch command. So the touch command is used to create files in the Linux operating system. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to head inside the directory that we have created in the previous video which was dir1 and in here we are going to create a new file with the name hello and it's going to be a text file so hello.txt. With the help of touch command you can simply create files without even typing the extension. That is because in Linux operating system, the extensions are not even required as every file is of the same type unless you need to explicitly specify a file for a particular software. For example, you want to create a new C file or C++ file for that you would have to put in the extension. Anyways, for now we are going to simply create this file which is going to be named as hello.txt and then hit enter. Now as soon as that is done, we are going to come over to our GUI, head inside the directory one folder and here we have our hello.txt file. Now we can open up this file and start writing some text data into this thing. So that is how you can use the touch command to create files. Now we can also use touch command to create a file without the extension. So we can simply type in touch and then hello world and then hit enter. Now if I open up the directory, it has the hello world file but this does not include any type of extension. Now the reason for not having an extension is that we can change this file into executable files. Suppose that if I open up this file and write in some batch script code and then I change the extension to .sh and then simply change the permissions to executable then that would become an executable script file. Anyways, that is how you can create files in the Linux operating system using the touch command. Now in this video we are going to talk about how to delete files and delete directories. Now to delete a particular file from the Linux file system you have this command which is rm. Now this command basically stands for remove. However, the issue is that many beginners take this command and try to use it to remove a directory. Well, this command cannot be used to remove a directory, it can only be used to remove files. So if I head inside my directory 1, in here we have these two files hello.txt and hello.world. Well, I'm going to put it side by side to my terminal and then I'm going to run the command rm space hello.txt and execute it. Now you would see as soon as I execute this command the hello.txt file from my folder is going to get deleted and just like that it was deleted. Now we can use that command again and try to delete the file which does not have an extension and just like that we were able to delete that file as well. Now our directory dir1 is completely empty so if I simply go ls it will show that there are no files within this directory. So that was the rm command in the Linux file system. Now in this video we are going to talk about the remove directory command. Well the command is really simple it's rm dir and then we follow it up with the directory that we want to remove. So as we are right inside the desktop and we want to remove this directory which is hello dir and we also want to remove this directory which is dir. So I would simply type in remove directory and dir1 that is going to remove this directory from our desktop. And then we can use the same command to remove this hello directory from the desktop as well. So that is how you can use the rmdir command to remove directories. Again, like I said in the previous video, do not get confused 
because rm and rmdir are two different commands which are used to remove two different types of files in the file system of linux while rm command is used to remove normal files or executable files from the file system rmdir command is used to remove the directories from the linux file system So now we are going to talk about the move command and the copy command. So open up a terminal. Now as you can see that we have this file hello1 onto the desktop. Now we are going to copy this file and paste it inside the downloads folder. So for that what we are going to do is that we are going to type in the command cp and then the name of our file which is hello1. Now make sure that the file is present in the present working directory and followed up by the file name is going to be the path for the directory in which you are going to paste this file. So it's going to be home slash kali slash downloads and then hit enter. After that, if I come to my GUI and open up my home folder and then head inside the downloads directory, now as you can see that I have the same exact file within this directory. Now, if I want to simply move this file from the desktop to my downloads folder, then in that case, I have the MV command. So the MV command takes in almost the same parameters. It's like the name of the file, which is hello one and then the destination so home slash kali slash downloads and then hit enter now as you can see that now this file has been removed from the desktop so if i open up my home directory and then head inside my download directory that file is still present right over here because it has been moved from desktop to downloads now this move command can also be used to rename a file so to showcase that let's head inside the downloads directory so cd slash home kali slash downloads now in here I'm going to type in the move command and then hello one and then followed up by the name that I want to give to this file not the path or the destination. So it's going to be hello two. Now as soon as I hit enter the name has been changed from hello one to hello two. So that is how you can use the cp command or copy command and the move command in the Linux file system. So now we are going to talk about the man command. So the man command actually stands for manual. So in Linux file system, there is something known as manual pages which you can access to view the details about a particular command. So let's take a command like remove directory. So we can simply open up a terminal and type in man and then followed up by remove directory or the command rmdir and then hit enter. Now this is basically going to open up the user manual for the rmdir command. Now this includes the name of the command, the synopsis, the description and all the flags that can be used with this particular command. When it comes to Kali Linux, then this manual command can also be used to view the user manuals of different tools that have been installed inside Kali. For example, if I come right over here, we have something known as the nmap, this one. So for example, if I want to know what are the commands to execute nmap and how to work with nmap, then I can simply come to my terminal, simply type in manual and then followed up by nmap and then hit enter. Now that is going to open up the nmap reference guide which includes the name, synopsis, descriptions and other details. However, if you want a more thorough user guide to nmap or in any other tool, then what you can do is that you can simply open up a Mozilla Firefox Explorer right over here. Now by default it is going to open up this file. Now this is the path of this file which is user share Kali defaults web homepage. Now in here, you can search for the tool that are pre-installed into this Kali image. So the tool at question was nmap. So if I simply type that in and here we have nmap, so if I click on it, I would be able to access the official documentation on nmap by kali.org. So that is how you can view the details and description along with the user guide for particular tools using the manual command and using the browser. Now. After this, we have come to the end of this section for basic commands. Now with the help of these commands, you can easily navigate through the file system of Linux, whether it is Kali or any other Linux. Now the reason for showing these commands for navigation is that sometimes when you are working with a particular tool, it requires you to input some data or input a file or maybe some output data into an output file. For that, you should be aware of how to navigate to the directories, folders, even permissions, executable permission and stuff like that. So that is why we have covered basic commands as the first section of our Kali Linux course. Now starting from this section, we are going to talk about network monitoring tools that come pre-installed with Kali Linux and we are going to start off with Wireshark. So this whole section is going to be about Wireshark. However, before jumping into Wireshark, I want to show you another command which is the nslookup command. 
Now, throughout this Kali Linux course, this command is going to be very crucial as this command is very simple. It plays a very important role when it comes to networking. So simply open up a terminal and then type in the command ns lookup and then followed up by a particular domain name server which can be www.google.com. What this command essentially does is that it provides the IP address, IPv4 address and the IPv6 address of your interdomain. Well, this is a very simple command. However, the impact that it has when it comes to networking is very huge. Now, if you want to check out the manual page for this NSLOOKUP command, then simply type in man space NSLOOKUP and then hit enter. So you would see all of the arguments that can be used with this NSLOOKUP command. Anyways, that brings us to the end of this very short video. But from the next video, we're going to start talking about Wireshark and how we can use Wireshark to monitor our network. So now we are actually going to dive into Wireshark. So what is Wireshark? Basically, Wireshark is a network monitoring tool or to be precise, it is a packet monitoring tool. So it is used to monitor every packet that is sent from your PC to a specific destination and even the replies that come from that destination to your PC. And it is not bound only to your PC. If you're connected to a network, then you can actually visit all of the traffic or all of the packets that are coming inside that network from some other PCs to our destination and from those destination to those some other PCs. Anyways, simply open up a terminal and simply type in Wireshark to open that up. Now, if you do that, that is going to open up this Wireshark GUI. However, there is another way of opening Wireshark. Now, for that, you would have to simply click on this top left Kali Linux icon and then come over to the ninth tab and choose Wireshark. This is also going to open up the same GUI for Wireshark. Again, if you want to visit the manual or the user guide for Wireshark, then simply type in the command man and search for Wireshark and then hit enter. That is going to show you the name, the description and so much more. So as you can see from the description, it says that Wireshark is a GUI network protocol analyzer. So the keyword over here is that it is a network protocol analyzer means that if you're connecting to a Wi-Fi network, which currently since we are using the virtual machine, we are not connecting to the Wi-Fi. We are actually connected to an Ethernet because the Wi-Fi connecting to our laptops or CPUs is being transmitted to this virtual machine as an Ethernet connection. But we don't have to worry about that. I mean, if you really want to connect to a Wi-Fi network, then you would have to connect an external adapter to your PC so that you can share it inside this virtual machine as a Wi-Fi adapter. Anyway, so it is a network protocol analyzer. Now it lets you interactively browse packet data from a live network or from a previously saved capture file. Now all we are concerned with is that it allows you to browse packet data. So simply open up Wireshark. Now let's talk about the GUI. On the very first screen, you can see all of these listings and this tiny little graph. So basically all of these listings are the ones that you can monitor. So as we're connecting to the ethernet, so it says at zero and then any, any would mean like all of the network devices that are connected to your PC. Then you have loopback and then we have the Bluetooth monitor that you can use to monitor the packet sent over a Bluetooth connection. But we are not concerned with that. All of the packets work in the same way. So going over to the Ethernet one would give us a better image. So simply choose Ethernet and you can see these graphs it means that there is some kind of activity within this network. So simply double click on it to open up the at zero capturing mode. Now, after you have selected Ethernet zero, you get this page. Now in here we have three different tabs. First of all, we have this tab where we can see all of the packets that are being sent to this network, which we are connected to using the at zero. After that, we have tabular dissector of each individual packet. And then we have this third tab, which is basically the data of the packets. And then we have other options like analyze statistics, telephony, wireless and so much more, but we are not concerned with that. For this course or for this basic introduction, we are only concerned with these three tabs and these two buttons. Now the very first icon that looks like the fin of a shark is actually to start capturing packets and the second one is to stop capturing packets. We don't want to keep the capturing enabled for a long period of time because we would capture a really large amount of packets and we won't be able to dissect it for our needs. So that is why it is pretty useful to stop capturing after you have done going over a particular website or a particular network. Now, once you have stopped capturing a network, you would see this whole list of the packets that it had captured within that time period. For now, I'm just going to explain a few things and then in the next video, I'm going to head over inside the package and how to read data from inside the packet data. 
First of all, this number tab is actually the number of packets that the Wireshark has captured. Basically, it is their ID. And then we have the time column. This basically explains the time elapsed since the capturing started for the packet to be received within this Wireshark application. And then we have the source. Source is basically that computer or that machine that initiated that request. Destination as we know is a destination of the request. And then we have the protocol, the protocol through which that packet was sent. Then we have the length of the packet and then we have the stream index. However, you might not have stream index as a column, but in the next video, I would show you what is the purpose of this stream index, how to use it and how to apply it as a column. And then we have a very basic information about the packet. And then we come over to this second group or second tab, which contains information which has been grouped into dissectors. So the very first dissector is frame. Now there is one important thing when you're working with dissector is that some of the fields are not encapsulated with square brackets while some of them are encapsulated with square brackets. Now the thing is that the fields that have been encapsulated by square brackets are not the part of the packet data. It has actually been provided by Wireshark so that it can organize them in a better way. Most of the times when we are working with dissectors, we would be concerned with internet protocol version and the TSL version too. Because through that we can find out the stream indexes and we can combine those streams to get the complete data of a particular request. And lastly in the third column, we have this some data that looks like garbage but it's not actually garbage. It is the actual data that is contained inside every packet. Now, one important thing is that once you're trying to recapture some data, it is going to ask you whether you want to save the data that has been captured previously or you want to start or start a new capture without saving the old data. So the choice is really up to you. Anyways, that was the basic introduction to Wireshark. Again, Wireshark is a network packet analyzer application that can be used to find vulnerabilities within a network. So now in this video, we are going to learn how do we capture data when we are surfing the internet or when we are trying to analyze a network. So the very first thing that I want to tell you is that if you have network capturing on, then all of the applications that are installed in your PC, even when you're not surfing the internet, are requesting some kind of data to their own servers. So that is why even though I had started the capture, but I was not searching for internet, I still had all of these packets. So you need to be wary of this thing that even if you're not surfing the internet, your PC is still sending some data and still receiving some kind of data over the network. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to open up Firefox and then we're going to head over something like youtube.com but I'm not just going to hit enter and visit YouTube the very first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to start the capture start it without saving come over to Firefox and then hit enter so that way I'm going to capture every packet that has been communicated between my PC and youtube.com server once that is done I'm going to stop capturing so that I don't get garbage data which is not useful for me now within this whole section of packets there are some packets that were communicated to my system or from my system to youtube.com but if you were to just look at it with the naked eye we cannot differentiate the packets which were from youtube so for that we need some kind of filter or some software that can basically cut down these packets and give us only those packets that were sent to youtube we can do that with the help of filtering now to apply a filter you would have to come right over to this field now in this field, we can apply any sort of filter. For example, let's start off with a protocol filters. So imagine that you are working with different types of networks and different types of data, and you want to organize that data depending upon the protocols. You want the data that was sent over the TCP protocol. So you would only type in the keyword TCP and hit enter. So that is going to filter these packets from TCP to others. And then as I have visited YouTube, I want to search for those TCP packets that contains the word YouTube. So I can simply go like TCP contains and then type in YouTube. Once that is done, I simply hit enter to filter my data. Now from like tens of packets, we are left with only three packets that contain the word YouTube. So if I simply select one of them and I, if I look over to the raw data, which is right over here, I can see that there is indeed the word YouTube present in this data. And the destination is this one. Now, it is pretty clear that the whole website of YouTube was not loaded with the help of these three packets. It must contain some other packets that were delivering data to us. We need to find those as well. Now to find those, we need to search for packets that had this IP address within them. 
Now to filter packets on IP address, we have this filter which is IP.ADDR which stands for address and then we put a space and then we put double is equal sign followed up by the IP address on which we want to apply the filter which is going to be 142.250.13.198 and then we simply press enter. Now we have all of the data that was sent between our PC and youtube.com. So if you come over to the very first packet that was received, you can see that the source was our PC because at first we were the one that initiated this request between youtube.com and our PC. And then later on, after two packets were sent, the source changed. It became the YouTube's IP address as source because we were receiving some of the data from youtube.com. And then even the protocol changed and if you look at info, a handshake was established between youtube.com and our PC. Let's talk about stream indexes. Sometimes when you are working with packets you want to know what is the stream of certain packets because packets are not sent in a sequence they are sent asynchronously meaning that you send multiple packets containing multiple requests and then you receive them in a random order still you want to combine all of the packets that are sent for a same or similar request we can do that with the help of streams so as you can see that there is a stream index right over here which is three now you might not even have the stream index as a column to get that Simply open up TCP and you would have this stream index field in the dissector. Simply right click on it and then select this option that says apply as column. Now that is going to apply stream index as a column. We are going to learn about following streams in the next section. But this section was all about filtering and capturing network. Now let's try something as heading over to google.com and filtering data for google.com. So I'm going to open up my Firefox. I'm going to start capture, continue without saving, search for google.com, hit enter and once the google.com has loaded, I'm going to stop capturing and clear out my filter. So this was all of the data that was sent within this time period. Again, I'm simply going to set the filter to TCP contains Google and then hit enter. And these are the three packets that were communicated between google.com and my PC. And if you look at the info, this says client hello web. We are basically trying to establish a handshake with google.com. Now we're going to filter all of the packets that were communicated between Google and our PC. For that, we are going to use the IP address. So the filter again is IP.ADDR, which stands for address, double equals, and then the IP address of our destination, which is 142.250.201.130, and then hit enter. And then we have all of this address. Now in the next section, we are going to learn about how to follow streams. And then in the later on section, we are going to learn what are the issues between HTTP and HTTPS websites. Because currently, if you head over to Google, we know that Google runs on HTTPS, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, which means that the data right over here would be encrypted. Anyways, that brings us to the end of this video. So now we are going to talk about following streams and how we can basically summarize a whole communication process that has been done between two different sources. So what we are going to do is that we are going to start capturing in Wireshark, continue without saving and then we are going to head over to Firefox and then we are going to visit google.com. Now we know that google.com is HTTPS secured so that is why we have this tiny lock icon meaning that it is totally secure. Well, I will explain you the difference in this video. So next up, we are going to visit youtube.com, which we also know works on HTTPS, which is secure. And then lastly, we are going to visit example.com. If you look closely right over to this icon, it has a little cross over it, meaning that it is not running on HTTPS, rather it is running on HTTP, which is not that secured, which is not encrypted. Once that is done, we can head over to Wireshark and stop the capturing process. Now, since I've shown you how to add the stream index to column, if not, come over to TCP, come over to stream index field, right click on it and use or select the option that says apply as column that will give you this stream index as a column within this tab. Now what we can do is that we can simply search for or filter TCP contains Google and over here we have this stream index that is zero. So if we want to basically combine all of the packets that were sent through the stream index zero, what we can do is that we can simply choose the first packet, right click on it, go to follow and then simply select this option that says TCP stream. Now what this would do is that it is going to follow this TCP stream and then it is going to combine all of these packets to make up a whole conversation. So now we have this whole conversation. So if we look right over here, 
we have 36 client packets and 19 server packets that were sent through this stream comprising the whole conversation that has been done between our PC and Google.com. Now, if we look over to the data, all of this is actually the real conversation that occurred between our PC and Google.com. The one in the red or pink is actually the client data, which in our case is our PC. And the one in the blue right over here is actually the data or the communication that was made by the server, which in our case is actually Google.com. And then we have again the client communication, the server communication and so much more. But if you were to read this, this is a bunch of random letters. So we cannot compromise any meaning out of this. This is because this Google.com was running on HTTPS which has data that is encrypted. Now we have this option in Wireshark that allows us to change the encoding of the data. So we can change it from ASCII to anything else. But that is not going to change the encryption that has been placed on this data. So that is why we are going to leave it as ASCII. But in case you are analyzing a data that is not secured, that is not encrypted and then you want it in some particular encoding, you can do that with the help of this field. Anyways, what we are now going to do is that we are simply going to search for TCP contains example.com. Now if I visit my Firefox again, again you can see that it was not encrypted. That is why we have this cross over the lock icon. So now if for example.com we did right click and then follow and then TCP stream and one more thing. As soon as I click the TCP stream, you are going to pay attention to this filter. So follow TCP stream and this filter changes to TCP stream equals to 23. And if we were to read this, we are somehow able to read the conversation that occurred between our PC and, and example.com. So the client request was a GET request. It was sent over HTTP and the host was example.com. It was sent through Mozilla 5.0 using Linux 86 and 64 bit architecture and so much more. So this is all of the information. Even though this is the entire conversation, we can still not get the data that was sent to our PC. Well, we have another follow stream that is known as the HTTP follow stream. So if we were to look for the protocol that says HTTP with the same stream index, then we are going to right click on it, go over to follow and choose HTTP stream. Now this time around, we would get the entire HTTP code of the example.com that was communicated to us by the server right over here. So that is how you can analyze the network, search for a particular domain, search for a particular packet, search for a particular stream and check out the data and then use the follow stream option actually combine the entire conversation that occurred between those two servers and then you can change the encoding to make the conversation readable. So that is how you can use the follow streams through Wireshark. So in this video, we are going to use Wireshark to analyze and to conclude why HTTP is considered to be a non-secured hypertext transfer protocol. And why does the browser prompt us that you are heading over to an HTTP site which is not secure. So you should be careful of the information that you put into that website. So for this, simply open up Wireshark. Then start a new capture, open up Firefox. And then we are going to head over a website that does not run on hypertext transfer protocol secured. It only runs on HTTP. So we have this website which is actually a login form and as you can see that the browser is prompting us that the connection is not secure. Well we are going to show you exactly why this connection is not secure. So the login form contains only two very simple fields which is the username and the password. So we are going to put in a random username which can be admin123 and then we can give the password as admin123 as well or maybe something else. And then we are going to simply click on login. Now, we do not have this particular credential on this website, so we don't have to worry about it, about this error, because we're not concerned with logging in. We're actually concerned with Wireshark. So we can now close the Firefox, stop the capturing. So now if we come over to this filter, we can simply search for TCP contains and then the website name like we used to do for google.com. So we simply type that in, hit enter. Then we have these packets, but we do, we're not concerned with the packets that are used for handshake. So we're just going to come over to follow and search for follow stream. Now in here, we are going to check for the client messages, which is this one, red one. And you can exactly see that the field name was text username and the text that we have placed was admin123 and the password was this is secured. So that is how 
someone who is in your network who is using wireshark to analyze the network or to analyze the packets within that network can easily get access to your credentials to your credit cards and so much more so that is why https is considered to be more secure as the data within that packets is always encrypted anyways another way of finding your password or another way of finding your username is by using the name of the field which is this one text username if you are familiar with it so i can simply search for tcp contains txt username and then we would be left with even lesser packets and then i would simply come over here and go through this raw data and here you can see that it says text username is equals to admin 123 and text password is equals to this is secured so that is why HTTPS is much more secured and that is how you can use Wireshark to analyze HTTP websites. So in this video, we are going to go over something which is known as Wireshark statistics. So simply open up your Wireshark and then we are going to start capturing on H0 and then we are going to open up Mozilla Firefox while the capturing is turned on and then we are going to head over some websites like google.com when that is completely loaded let's go over to youtube.com and then we are going to go over to example.com well the main purpose of this is so that we can use the statistic tools on a capture that has multiple conversations in it so now we can close down this firefox stop the capturing and right over here in these tabs we have different tabs capture analyze statistics telephony wireless and so much more well analyze is basically applying filters which we have done and following a tcp stream or following a udp stream http stream and so much more basically we are done with all of these but there is something much more important which is known as statistics now statistics contains a lot of tools that can help summarize the whole capture into smaller individual parts for example if i were to go to statistics and head over this tool that says conversation now what this is going to do is that it is going to take all of the packages or all of the packets that it had captured and organize them depending upon the conversations so over ethernet 2 packets were 2248 now this was also the same amount of packets that were discovered during this capture process and then if you were to simply shift over to ipv4 app then you can see that there are only 19 conversations remember this is not 19 packets it's basically 19 separate conversations so we have the address one which is actually the address of our virtual machine and then the source address and then we have the total number of packets that were transferred or communicated during this conversation the size or the entire size of all of these packets which is 11k and then the packets that were sent from address a to b bytes sent to a to b packets sent back from b to a bytes sent back from b to a and then we have something known as the rel start which stands from relative start and then the duration and then we have bits per second from a to b and bits from second from b to a well one of the most important things or the most important column during this conversation tool is actually the relative start and the duration it is quite hard to see it but there is a slight gray background on these two columns which is relative start and duration well if you look at the third row you can see that it is starting from 0.61 meaning from the start of the capture and it lasted for 28 seconds now if you were to go over to something like this one which starts at 11 seconds so the gray background has been shifted towards a little right so basically this is something known as a graphical representation of the relative start and the total amount of duration so as you can see right over here something with a lesser duration like this one the very first entry which has a duration of 13 it starts from the start of the capture at 0, 0.0 seconds and lasts for 13 seconds and that is why this bar has been cut in half because the duration was almost the entire half of my capture capturing process and then you can change the sorting to ipv6 tcp protocol which contains 24 conversation if we are if we were to sort this in tcp and if you were to sort it in udp protocol then we have a total number of 43 conversations well these tools are really great for summarizing a whole capture or summarizing the network after that if we open up statistics there is something known as protocol hierarchy now if you come from a networking background then you would know what a protocol hierarchy is well if not then you don't have to worry much about this because you're probably not looking to become an analytic guru in wireshark capturing so that is why you don't have to pay much attention to this but still it is a very good tool if you want to know the protocol hierarchy of a certain capture because it is not always necessary that you are going to be the one who is going to be capturing using wireshark you might be the one who is going to analyze someone else's capture so that is why it is really useful to know the protocol hierarchy 
hierarchy of the network capture. The very first thing or the total amount of packets were stored or done through frame and Ethernet 100 packets, 100% packet. IPv4 had 99.9% .9 of packets, whereas inside IPv4, UDP had 75% packets, TCP had 24% of packets. Anyways, we can go along the tabs and summarize the network in a better way. After that, in the statistics tab, we have something known as the input output graph. Well, this is a very simple graphical representation of the total number of packets received per second during the entire duration of the capture. So as you can see right over here, at around 13th second of the capture, we received more than 400 packets. At around 5 seconds, we were receiving 200 packets per second. So this gives you an overview of the packets per second or the speed of packets on which they were delivered or transferred. And then if you want to find out the length of the packets or the average length of the packets, then you have this tool which is known as packet lens. So it tells you that there were a total of 2249 packets and there were 0 packets of the length 0 to 19, 0 packets of the length 20 to 39, 783 packets of the length 40 to 79 and the highest number is this one which is 942 packets of the length more than 1280 and less than 2559. So this is also a great tool if you want to get more information about the packets that were captured. And then lastly, you can also summarize the entire conversation or the entire capture in two different endpoints. So if I were to change this tool to endpoint, then according to endpoints, there were 20 conversations made. According to IPv6, there were zero conversations made. According to TCP protocol, there were 38 endpoints which made different conversations. And for UDP, there were 56 different endpoints which made the conversations. We can even learn about the ports from here. For example, if someone is running a port scan, let's say the IP address is this one, 192.168.112.1, he starts the scan from the subnet 1 and goes through the entire subnet. That would mean that he goes to 192.168.11.255. That would be the entire subnet. And if he is doing a port scan, then through the entire subnet, the ports would remain the same. It would be either 443 or 80 or any specific one which he is using to scan. So this endpoint tool can give you a general summary of what the network user was trying to do. Anyways, these were some of the statistic tools that are inside Wireshark which you can use to summarize a whole capture. That also sums up this section for Wireshark. Now Wireshark can be used for a variety of different So in this video or in this whole section, we are going to be talking about another network capturing tool which is known as the TCP dump. Now TCP dump is somewhat similar to Wireshark and somewhat different to Wireshark as well. And the best part about this TCP dump is that it can actually capture packets from all seven layers of the OSI model. Now you must have an understanding of OSI model if, if you are going for the Kali operating system course because OSI model is the most important step or the most important knowledge that you must have before entering the world of networking. Even if you do not have adequate knowledge about the OSI model, that is still acceptable as we are just going to be dipping inside or the dipping in the very first step of the TCP dump. But still, I would like to tell you that TCP dump is considered to be more powerful than Wireshark. And the best part is that it can be used alongside Wireshark because there are some features that are missing in TCP dump. And the very first feature is that TCP dump is not actually a graphical user interface application. It works on command line. So in this way, Wireshark has an edge that it gives you a graphical representation of the data captured. On the other hand, TCP dump has its own advantages. So open up a terminal and search for manual and then TCP dump and then hit enter. So this is the TCP dump user manual. So as you can see that it is used to dump traffic on a network. TCP dump prints out a description of the contents of packets on a network interface that match the boolean expression. Now this is something different. I mean we get the part that it displays the contents of packets just like we did with Wireshark. But what do we mean by that match the boolean expression? Well worry not, I'm just going to be explaining it to you in a very short while. So. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to open up another terminal. Since we are not inside the root user, I'm going to switch over to the root user by typing in the command sudo space hyphen i. Just because I don't want to type in the command sudo for every command of TCP dump. So type in the password and shift over to the root user. Now once inside the root user, I'm just going to type in tcp dump 
and then I'm going to put a space double hyphen help and then hit enter. Now as you can see that this help command shows you details about the TCP dump. So the TCP dump version is 4.99.1 and Opal SSL version is 1.1.1n and so much more. And then you have use it. So to use TCP dump, you have to use the command TCP dump followed up by different flags. You can find a lot more details if you head over to Mozilla Firefox and open up TCP dump from there. But this help command is sadly it's a bit disappointing that it does not show how to use each of these commands. But worry not, I'm going to show you some of them or the most used ones. So the very first flag that we're interested in is, is the hyphen I. So TCP dump space hyphen I. Now if you see over here, hyphen I stands for interface right over here. So after you have typed hyphen I, you need to basically specify the interface that you want to capture the packets on. So in our case, just like with Wireshark, the interface is eth0. And then you can type in other flags. It's not eth0, it's eth0. With this, if I simply type in enter, it is going to start capturing data. But I won't be able to see anything onto the terminal. That is because we are missing another flag which is basically present in almost all flavors of Linux which is the verbose flag. So I'm just going to press Ctrl C so that I can close out this command, type in tcp dump, paste hyphen i and then my interface which is eth0 and then I'm going to go with hyphen v. Now this v basically means verbose. So verbose what it does is that it basically prints out all of the data onto the terminal. So if I now hit enter. The very first line is like it is listening on eth0. Now these are the packets that it has captured. Let's open up Firefox. Let's just go google.com and we have even more packets. Now as I've mentioned before, if I close down this Firefox and I stop my packet capturing by control C. Now on the terminal, this seems a little too congested. So that is why we have flags that allow us to filter, thus creating a boolean expression. So if I head over to my command, so if I were to type in a specific condition that, okay, since I visited google.com, so I want to specify a filter that only capture those packets which have the destination or the source as google.com or maybe the host as google.com, then that part would be considered as the boolean expression and every packet that proves that boolean expression to be true would be listed inside this terminal. So that was the very basic introduction of TCP dump. However, I'm going to further explain TCP dump in a little more detail in the coming videos. Now when we are talking about the TCP dump and I've already mentioned that it is quite different from Wireshark. Well, the reason for that is in Wireshark, you basically capture all of the data for a particular interface and then you apply the filters. So basically you are actually collecting a large sum of data which takes up space and then you are storing it inside your memory or your file and then you are trying to apply filters on that. But what if you want to capture data for a very long time which would give you large sums of data but you only require data with a certain condition. So that would basically mean that using up too much space for a very little amount of data that you actually require. This is where TCP dump takes the upper hand. So basically, if I want to filter out my data during the capture process so that only the data which has my filter will be captured and stored inside the memory, thus causing us to use less amounts of memory. That is why we have filters in TCP dump during the capture process. So we type in TCP dump hyphen I specifier interface, make sure that the verbose is on. Currently, we want to simply print out the data onto the terminal and coming in the later videos, we are going to learn how to store this data into a separate file and then read that file in Wireshark or any other packet analyzer. So now the very first filter that you can apply is a very basic one that is host. So simply type in the word host and then you can specify the host like google.com and start the listening. Now, as you can see that if I open up my Firefox, now usually at this moment, Wireshark would have started capturing some packets while when it opened up this HTML page. Or well, let's just visit youtube.com. As you can see that we are not capturing any packet whatsoever in the terminal. Basically, it does not matter what the users are visiting on your network if you are working with TCP dump and filters. Now, if I were to actually visit google.com, 
you will see that as soon as I open up google.com, I have started receiving packets in my terminal. And you don't have to worry about sub subdomains of a particular host as in I open up gmail.com which is a subdomain of Google, I would still receive new packets right over here. So that is the very basic of the filters which is host. Now this data does not contain any packet that we do not require or that is taking up space unnecessarily. So the next filter that we are going to talk about is the protocol. So what we can do is that we can simply go like tcp dump hyphen i at zero and we are going to verbose it and simply search for UDP. Now it is going to look for all of the packets that have the protocol set to UDP and nothing else than that. So as soon as I opened up Mozilla Firefox, you can see that I have started receiving some packets. But if we go over to every packet and search for this proto tag, you can see that the protocol is set to UDP. You won't see any other protocol over here. Again, the benefit of this is that you only store the packets that are necessary according to your condition. Similar to UDP, you can also search for TCP protocols. You simply type in the same command and change the flag keyword from UDP to TCP and then hit enter. And then you can open up Mozilla Firefox, go over to some website like youtube.com and you would be receiving only TCP protocol packets. And then we can also apply filters for the source and for the destination as well. Now to do this, the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to open up ifconfig. By doing this, I would get the IP address of this virtual machine, which is 192.168.112.128. Now I can do is tcp dump hyphen i at zero hyphen v for verbose and then I can set the destination, the keyword is DST and then I can type in the IP address as 192.168.112.128 and then hit enter. Now it is going to only receive the packets that are coming or that has the destination equal to my machine's IP address. So basically this is all of the incoming traffic to my virtual machine. Now I can change it for outgoing traffic as well. I simply need to change the flag from destination to source so the keyword would be src and then hit enter now it is listening for all the packets that have the source equal to the ip address of my machine or the outgoing traffic of my machine and in case you want to actually filter out everything you want the whole network filtered out you can do that as well now to do that the command is tcp dump space hyphen i at zero which is our interface verbose and then the keyword net and then you need to specify the subnet so 192.168.1.0 and I'm just going to go for 24. Now it is going to scan only these subnets and then you can also use the TCP dump to figure out the packets coming from a secure website which uses HTTPS. For that simply type in TCP dump hyphen I specify your interface verbose and then you are going to specify whether the port is of the source or of the destination. So I want incoming traffic to my machine from an HTTPS website. So it is going to be source and then the keyword port followed up by 443. Once that is done, I'm going to open up my Firefox, visit google.com which runs on HTTPS and just like that we are now getting incoming traffic from HTTPS website. And if you look right over here at protocol, most of the times HTTPS websites use TCP protocol. So that is what we can confirm from right over here. Most of the packets are running on TCP protocol. So that is how you can apply different filters on TCP dump. So just like Wireshark, we can actually use multiple filters at the same time with the help of TCP dump. So open up a terminal. Move over to the root user by typing in the command sudo space hyphen i, provide the password and you're inside the root user. And then what you're going to do is that you're going to type in tcp dump, you're going to specify the interface, you're going to make it verbose and then what you can do is that you can look for incoming traffic on your network from the port number 443 but which has the destination as your PC. So basically we are trying to combine two different filters. And the way to do that is simply type in the first filter which is src port 443 and then you need to use the keyword as a and d. Now this and is just like logical gates. So basically you are trying to implement the and logical gate which means that both of these conditions must be satisfied. So we simply type in source port 443 and dst which stands for destination is equals to 192.168.112.128 which is the IP address of my virtual machine. So now if I hit enter. Now it is only going to scan the network for incoming traffic from a secured website with the destination equal to my machine. 
So let's refresh this google.com and we have all of these packets listed over here. So that is how you can combine different filters. You can even combine source and destination filters and so much more. So basically you can apply the same number of filters which you can in Wireshark even without the GUI interface. Now as I explained in the first video of this section is that the TCP dump is better at capturing packets because it saves us a lot of memory since we are simply trashing all of the packets that do not meet our requirements or our boolean expression. But the truth is that even though TCP dump is better at capturing, it is not that much better at analyzing. So that is why what most people do is that they capture the packets using the TCP dump because it can scan the seven layers of the OSI model and then they do an external software or application to analyze that which uses a GUI just like Wireshark. Now for this what you need to do is that you need to capture data using TCP dump, store it inside a PCAP file. Remember that PCAP is an extension which can be read by analyzers. So store it in a PCAP file and then try to read that PCAP file in any other packet analyzer which we are going to be using as Wireshark. So let's do that now. So shift over to the root user, type in TCP dump, specify your interface, then specify verbose. Even though you might think that verbose were used to print out data onto the terminal, so why are we using verbose when we are going to be storing this data inside a file? Well, verbose is going to simply print out how many packets have been found and written to the file, nothing else than that. So hyphen v and then we are going to simply type in the flag hyphen w. Now this flag is for the external file. After that, we need to provide the name for our file. So it can be anything like capture dot pcap. Now the thing is that, that this file would be placed at the present working directory but I want to place it on the desktop so I'm just going to put in the complete path as forward slash home forward slash kali forward slash desktop forward slash capture dot pcap and then I can add in my filters so I'm just going to add in the filter as destination is equals to 192.168.112.128 which was the IP address of our machine. Once that is done, I'm going to simply hit enter and as you can see there, the terminal now says that it got some number, it got zero meaning that there were no packets which met this condition with the destination this one and nothing has been written to the file. And if you look at the desktop, a new file has been created which has this tiny little lock on it with the name capture.pcap. Now simply open up a Firefox browser, go to some random websites, let's just go to google.com and then let's go to youtube.com and lastly we are going to go to example.com. So if you look at our terminal, we have well over a thousand packets received. So simply stop this scan by pressing Ctrl plus C. The terminal shows us nothing. Now what we want to do is we want to open up this file capture.pcap in any packet analyzer. The cool thing is that the pcap extension itself stands for packet capture. So right click on it and open with any analyzer that you want. We would be using with Wireshark because that is the tool that we have explained in the previous section. And now once you have captured from the seven layers of the OSI model, you can come to Wireshark with a GUI and filter it out, analyze the data however you like. You can use statistics which we have covered in the previous section as well. Anyways, that was how to use TCP dump together with Wireshark. So in this section, we are going to talk about network scanning. Previously, we were talking about network monitoring. Basically, we were monitoring the activities that are going around in our network. And to monitor network, we use tools like Wireshark and TCP dump. But this time around, we are going to be scanning the network or scanning a particular website or scanning a particular address. And why do we scan things? We scan it to get some kind of information. So basically, this section is about getting information or we can say reconnaissance. So reconnaissance is a military term basically to gather information. But when it comes to information technology, reconnaissance is the first step in which you gather information about a particular server, particular group of networks or a particular IP address. It can be anything. Basically, it, it is all about gathering information. Now, the tool that we are going to be using within this section for network scanning is going to be by far the most widely used tool which is known as Nmap. To open up Nmap, simply click on this Kali logo and then 
In the first tab which stands for information gathering, you can see nmap right over here. And if you open it up, you can clearly see that nmap does not have a GUI. It runs on command line and if you simply scroll up, you would see that it takes quite a lot of flags, quite a lot of parameters. At first, for new beginners, it might seem quite intimidating. But once you get to know how to use nmap, all of this stuff becomes really easy or really basic. Starting from the top, we have the nmap version. So currently in Linux, we are working with nmap version 7.92. And then we have the nmap uses. So basically you use the command nmap and then you can specify any type of parameters and at the end, this is the required field. We need to specify the target. Let's just not mess around with this uh, whole bunch of information that is going to be quite intimidating for us. Therefore, we're just going to move on to the description of nmap. Now, what we can do is that we can open up a new terminal, search for manual and map. This gives us a much better description of the tool nmap. So basically, it says that nmap network exploration tool and security slash port scanner. Yes, it is an exploration tool which explores the targeted host. And in the description, we can see that nmap is a network mapper. It is an open source tool for network exploration and security auditing. Now, let me just put it to you. nmap is used to scan a particular host. The scanning can depend upon if you want to do a port scan to check for the services that the host has available or check for the version of operating system the host is running on or a lot of other stuff like you can check for TCP data, you can search for email host, you can search for UDP host, you can search for uh, the available firewalls and stuff like that. So this is all about reconnaissance. Now the thing is that nmap requires elevated privileges. So if you want to start using nmap, you would have to type in the command sudo for every command of nmap and I don't like to do that. So I'm just going to shift over to the root user by typing in the command sudo space hyphen i and then I'm going to simply type in my password which is Kali. Now we are going to primarily focus on these examples. That is because we just want to get to know how to use nmap because we are just starting out with nmap. Now you can see an interesting example that it has a link of scanme.nmap.org. I'm just going to simply copy this, open up my Firefox browser and then I'm going to paste in that address and hit enter. So as you can see that it is a web page hosted by nmap organization and it says that hello and welcome to the scanme.nmap.org a service provided by the nmap security scanner project and the main purpose of this whole website is that you can test out your nmap installation by running some scans on this website. Basically nmap is a noisy scanner. This means that when you're trying to scan a host, it can leave large amount of traces that you are being scanned. The firewalls can easily detect nmap scanning. Well, if you become a really good nmap scanner, then you can easily avoid firewalls but that is something that we are not going to cover in this course, we are just going to get a hint of nmap. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to run a very simple nmap command without the use of any parameters or any flags. So we are just going to go with nmap and then we are going to simply follow it up with www.google.com and then we are going to wait for the scan to be completed. But as soon as you hit enter you can see that it shows us a little description of the current version of nmap and then the date and the time on which the nmap scan was started. So wait for the nmap scan to be fully completed. Now once the scan is completed, you can see a little detail about the scan right over here. So let's read it line by line. So it says that this is the scan report for nmap on google.com and then followed up by the IP address of the google.com server. And then it says that the host is up and the latency from this particular virtual machine to the host was this much. And then it also shows us that there were other addresses for google.com which were not scanned and then it displays those addresses right over here which in our case is actually an IPv6 address. And then it shows you that there was an RDNS record for this particular host which we were scanning which was this one. And then it also shows you that it tried to scan 998 filter TCP ports which did not respond. So only two of those ports responded and these ports are right over here. So the port number 80 was turned on which was running on TCP protocol and the service running on it was HTTP and then the port number 43 was on running on TCP protocol state was open and the service running on it was HTTPS. So that was a very basic scan of nmap. Now by default nmap only scans 1000 ports so that is why we have these two ports and 998 non-responsive ports. But in the future videos, we are going to learn how to do other types of scan, how to do port scanning, how to do SYN scanning, SYNAX scanning, 
UDP scanning and even how to do a specific port range scan. Anyways, this was a very basic use of Nmap. Now when we are talking about network scanning, I have mentioned something known as reconnaissance in the previous video. Now reconnaissance sometimes does not even require a specific tool. Reconnaissance simply means information gathering about a particular target. Now this is the very first step when you are trying to do pen testing. So reconnaissance can even mean getting the IP address of a certain host. It can even be about knowing what is the provider of a certain IP address. I mean we have this website that we had previously used scanme.nmap.org if I open up the terminal and type in ns lookup which we have used in the wireshark section and I said that this is a very basic tool which is ns lookup that is because we can use it to identify the IP address of certain websites certain domains so I can just go like scanme.nmap.org and then hit enter. Now even getting this IPv4 address can be considered as information gathering or reconnaissance and getting this IPv6 is the same. So now what I can do is that I can simply copy this IPv4, again type in NS lookup and then paste in the IPv4 of this website and then hit enter. So even doing it the other way around is also known as reconnaissance. And NS lookup is still a tool and I have said that you don't even need tools for reconnaissance so we can simply copy this IP address head over to google.com or any other search engine and then we can simply type in the IP address and hit enter or to make it much more clear we can type in who is followed up by the IP address. Now this is going to bring up a lot of pages that can give you the details of the domain hosted on this particular IP address. So as you can see that from this IP address or from this who is page we can see that this domain is hosted in Fremont, California, United States and it is hosted on a Linode. And we can see other stuff like that. It has privacy enabled, any cache is not enabled and stuff like that. You can also use major IP blocks. Simply search that in any search engine and you will be brought to this page. From here you can see the major IP addresses blocks by countries. So I can open up any country and then I would be able to view all of the major IP address blocks for that specific country. I can take any IP block, copy it. Again, go to my search engine and type for who is followed up by the starting address of the IP block and I would see a lot more information about that particular IP block. So this particular website is showing me all of the addresses that are located within this IP block. So even doing this is known as reconnaissance and even doing this without any tool is important in network scanning. So in the first video of this section, we did a very basic scan on google.com. But this time around, we are going to run an nmap scan with some of the basic flags that are even written in the example. So what I am going to do is that I am going to open up Kali Linux, go to information gathering, open up nmap. Because I want to see this example. Then I am going to go over to the root user by typing in the command sudo space hyphen i and the password is Kali. And then I am going to simply copy this command and then paste it over here. And then I am going to hit enter. But before hitting enter, you can see that the small hyphen V stands for WordPress and the capital A stands for enable OS detection, version detection, script scanning and trace route. Now we are going to go through all of these once the scan is done. So simply hit enter and then wait for the scan to complete. Now once the scan is completed, you can see that there is a lot of information by using only one flag which was hyphen capital A. So let's break down this description of the scan one by one. So let's start from the top where there is a lot of unnecessary information on it so we are not going to go over that we are just going to go over some important steps like this one so it initiated a sin stealth scan well we are going to talk about the sin stealth scan in the later video and it discovered these are the open ports on scanme.nmap.org so the port number 22899293337. After that, what it did was that it initiated the OS detection. And after the OS detection, it initiated the trace route. Now, the results of these OS detection and trace route are also written down below. So, the very first result that is mentioned is of the ports and their services running on them. So, on the port number 22, which is a TCP protocol, the state is open, the service running is SSH. And then you have the version of that service. So, the SSH version is Open SSH 6.6.1 running on Ubuntu and the Ubuntu protocol is 2.0. So you can see the amount of detail that we get from using Nmap. 
and since it was an SSH protocol, it has even discovered the host keys for SSH and it has even mentioned the encoding for each individual host key. So as you can see right over here, the first host key has the encryption as DSA and then RSA, then ECDSA and then this last one. And then on the port number 25, which is in the filtered state, the service is running as SMTP which is used for mail transfer protocol. And port number 80, which is an HTTP service which is used to host their website, the version is Apache. So basically they're using an Apache to host their HTTP service. And the HTTP methods that are supported by this website is get, head, post and options. And you can even get the HTTP title, fav icon, the HTTP server header, which is Apache 2.4.7. And then you get other information about different ports. Once the port details are done, you get the operating system guesses. So basically Nmap is now trying to guess which operating system is actually hosting the whole server. So basically it is checking the similarity index which is 91% for Linux 2.6.32 and it is going to check that similarity index for different versions of Linux. And then it is going to come up with the operating system that has the most amount of similarity index. And lastly on this description, we have the trace route. So basically this is the entire trip of our request from our virtual machine to our gateway to at the endpoint scanme.nmap.org. So it went from our virtual machine's IP address and headed over to this default gateway. Now we can actually confirm this by opening up a new terminal and typing in if config and we can see that we have the IP address of this virtual machine as 192.168.18.21. So since it has .21 at the end, so .1 would be our default gateway. So our request went to our gateway, went to the network service provider and then went to 22 different hosts to actually read scanme.nmap.org. And these hosts are written in sequence. And then right over here, you have the entire round trip time in milliseconds. So that is how you can use the nmap with the flag capital A to get the information about trace route, port scanning and operating system detection. So now in this section we are going to be talking about port scanning in nmap. So basically whenever you are working with nmap you don't want to scan a whole range of ports or like a thousand ports. So if I came over here and did sudo nmap let's just go with www.google.com and then hit enter give it a few seconds and just like that as you can see by default it searches for 1000 ports so just look at that we only have two ports which were turned on on google.com and we have wasted our search for 998 ports so that is not a good practice what if I simply wanted to search for HTTP service or HTTPS service because most of the time the nmap is used it is to search for open ports which can determine that a particular service is running on a particular domain. For example, HTTP service is almost every time is running on port number 80. So for cases like these, what we really want to do is that we want to search for particular ports. Now why is it so important? So imagine that you are searching for let's say you're not searching for a single domain, you're actually going over an entire network of domain or an entire network of subnets uh, of a particular organization, then you have a massive amounts of data and that massive amount of data is going to take up a lot of time to scan and not only that, it is also going to produce huge amount of noise. Noise is nothing but being noticeable to firewalls. So you don't want that, you simply want to target a specific port number so that you can find out that a specific service is running or not. Now for this example, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be pinging or scanning my default gateway which is 192.168.18.1 and then hit enter. Now even on this default gateway, you would see that it did 1000 scan and came up with these 6 different ports or these 6 different services that was running. What if I only wanted to search for the FTP service which is most commonly than not running on port number 21? Well I can easily do that with the help of the port flag. So to implement a port flag, you simply type in nmap and then you simply type in the flag hyphen p. After this, you need to provide in the port. So I want to search for FTP service. It's running on port number 21. So I would do that. And then I have my targeted source. So it's 192.168.18.1 and then hit enter. And you can see the difference. I mean, 
1000 scans with 994 failed scans and 6 successful scans it took 3.24 second and then a one single scan on a particular domain looking for a particular service on a particular port only took me not 6 seconds so that is why this technique can save you a lot of time when you're searching for a particular port and as i've already mentioned that it also keeps you away from firewalls now this port scanning can also be used to actually increase the range of ports that we're scanning we already know that nmap actually searches for 1000 ports by default what if we want to increase that well simply type in nmap the target and then the port flag and then you can provide the range so i want to search from port number 20 to let's say 8080 which would give me a total subset of 8060 ports and then hit enter obviously it's searching for more number of ports so that is why it's going to take a larger amount of time so now it searched for 8060 services to be precise 8061 ports this might not be useful but it is good to know that how to give a specific port range This same example can also be used to search for specific ports which do not lie in the range between 0 and 1000 but they actually lie between let's say 1001 and 2000 so 1001 and then 2000 even though it is not going to return me anything but at least i would know that it searched for 1001 to 2000 ports and then you can even provide a smaller range of ports so For example, if I wanted to search for FTP service which runs on port 21, SSH on 22 and Telnet running on 23. So I simply need to give my port number from 21 to 23 and then hit enter. So you see that the scan time is going down as I specify my search port. Similarly, if I wanted to search for let's say HTTPS service which is hypertext transfer protocol secured which we have talked about in the network monitoring session, So I would go like nmap port number 443 which is the port number for https and I would go with www.google.com and I could check whether that service is enabled or not and it only took us not 41 seconds so that is how you can do port scanning with the help of nmap So in this video we are going to be using nmap to do two things first is we are going to search our entire network with all the different subnet so that we know what are the hosts that are currently up and using our internet or our network and the second thing is that we want to basically store the result of our nmap scan into some external file because sometimes around you spend a lot of time while scanning a particular network or a network of an organization it can take up to 2 or 3 4 hours and then you basically sometimes accidentally close down this terminal and thus losing all of the data of the scan you don't want to do that so we're going to run both of these things simultaneously so the very first thing is simply heading over to the root user so sudo i and kali and then i'm going to run nmap and to make it so that my nmap can store the result of the scan into a file i'm going to use the flag o and capital g followed up by another hyphen and then i'm going to type in the ip address of my default gateway now to find this default gateway simply open up a new terminal and type in if config now in here you would see different network adapters connecting to your virtual machine since i'm running on h0 so i'm just going to go over this one so my default ip is 192.168.18.21 so my default gateway is going to be 18.1 but my entire subnet is going to be 18.0 up to the maximum range which is written right over here which is 255 so i'm going to provide the maximum range of all the subnets so 192.168.18.0 and then a hyphen which is going to depict the range to 255 after that i want to verbose so the verbose as we have seen in the first video is used to display all of the steps that are being performed by nmap and you can get even more detail by using a double verbose so a double verbose is simply hyphen v and v and then i'm going to use this greater than symbol the path of file where i want to store my results so i'm just going to store it at home kali desktop and on the desktop i want to create a file with the name results and then i would simply hit enter now the scan is running a new file has been created on my desktop and when the scan is completed i would be able to view this file and view the result of my scan 
and you can see that the scan has completed so open up my results file from my desktop and it contains a lot of information because we were running double verbose it even contains the command that we executed so it is going to search for 1000 ports over 255 host and for each individual host we have information written down over here so the very first thing is that all of this information is listed or sorted depending upon the status of the host so from the start we have those hosts which are down and at the very bottom we have the host that have the status of up so this 192.168.18.1 is basically our default gateway so that is why it is coming as up and then .13 is actually the IP address of my host machine on which I am running this virtual machine and then 21 as we already know is the IP address of my virtual machine at zero connection. So that is how you can search for an entire subnet and that is how you can also store the result of an nmap scan into an external file. So in the last video we learned how to use this grabable format flag which requires a file and then we learned how to export the scan to a file with the help of this greater than symbol. Now in this video we are going to talk about the different scanning options even though we cannot cover them all but we are going to go through most of them or just give you an idea how to use different types of scanning methods. So simply open up nmap so that you can see what we did in the previous video was this hyphen o and capital G which stands for grabable format. And we have also used this flag which is the hyphen capital A which is used for OS detection, version detection, script scanning and trace route. But what if we do not want all of this data? What if we only want to search for service versions? So simply head over to the root user, initialize nmap and then to find out the service version we have this flag hyphen S and then capital V which stands for service version followed up by the host so the host is going to be scanme.nmap.org and then hit enter now as you can see on the terminal that this scan mainly focuses on the services and their versions if it can deduce it now why are the versions so important so basically when you're trying to perform pen testing you need to run some kind of penetration testing depending upon the version of the service that you are running on the host so like it says over here that it is running ubuntu protocol 2.0 so basically you do not want to test the host against ubuntu protocol 3.0 that would simply waste your time so you want to customize your test or pen testing in such a way that it is only meant for the service that is running on the host so that is why this flag hyphen sv comes into play the next flag that we're going to talk about is hyphen capital f now this flag basically stands for fast so this is a faster scan as you can see that it only took us 2.48 seconds now this scan does not search for the default 1000 ports it actually search for the 100 ports from 0 to 100 and in most of the cases these are the most important ports containing SSH service, SMTP service, HTTP service and SMTP services as well so that is how you can do a very fast scan upon a particular host and then we have another scan if you look over here this second port port number 25 running the SMTP server was in the filtered state well filtered state is something uh, which the nmap cannot deduce as open or closed in case you want to search for only those ports that are open then you can simply use this flag which is double hyphen open and then hit enter now this is also a cool way of only finding out the open ports so that you can perform pen testing on your own host again this particular search is quite faster than the default search as it is only looking for open ports and then we have something which is known as the ST scan so the flag is hyphen S followed up by capital T now this scan stands for TCP connect scan or the full open scan or the full connect scan now in this scan you basically try to establish a three-way handshake between your virtual machine or the host on which you're running the nmap and the targeted host and only the scan is returned when the three-way handshake is complete for every port so that is why it is considered to be a slower scan as it is trying to connect to the tcp port three-way handshake on every 1000 port and if you increase that range of 1000 then that would cause it to become even more slower so simply type the command in and hit enter and then wait for the scan to complete so this is the result of the tcp connect scan 
Now the last scan that we're going to talk about is hyphen small s followed up by capital S. Now this is a scan that you would often see when you're viewing different tutorials on how to use nmap. Now this is the syn scan syn or often commonly known as the stealth scan. Basically it is a half open scan as compared to the TCP scan it does not wait for the complete handshake or the complete three way handshake to complete and we can even see because of this half open scan it is faster and to conclude that we can simply see over here that the TCP open scan or the full connect scan actually took 19.14 seconds in my case and on my PC it only took us 7.53 seconds for the half open or the stealth scan and also another reason this is known as the stealth scan is that it produces comparatively lesser noise to TCP scan. Anyways, these were some of the main or most commonly used scanning flags for Nmap and that also brings us to the end of this section. So in this video, in this section, we are going to basically convert our Kali Linux virtual machine into a man in the middle platform. So basically what a man in the middle means that our Kali Linux would become the middle point of the exchange of data between a host or domain and on the other hand a host running on our network. It can be one of the subnets of our default gateway or it can be any other host within our network. Now to set this up the very first thing is that you need to enable IPv4 forwarding on your Kali Linux. Now to do this we are simply going to open up terminal and the first thing is that we are going to know whether IPv4 forwarding is turned on or not. So type in cat followed up by slash proc slash system slash net slash ipv4 and then slash underscore forward. Now this is going to show you the current value of IP forwarding. If this value says zero then that means that ipv4 forwarding is turned off so you need to turn it on. Now there are two ways of turning on ipv4 forwarding on your virtual machine. So type in the command echo one and then followed up by a greater symbol then the path to the file which is proc sys net ipv4 and then ipv4 forwarding. So hit enter. In case this command does not work for you then you can run the system control command and with the help of that command you can actually change this value of ip forwarding. So head over to the root user and the command is systemctl hyphen w net dot ipv4 dot ip underscore forward is equals to 1. So that is going to set the IP forwarding value to 1. Now the next step is that we are going to be using something known as Ettercap. So simply open up search and search for Ettercap. And the thing that we are going to use is going to be Ettercap graphical. So you need to provide the password for the root user which is Kali. So simply authenticate and you would be brought to this page of Ettercap. Now let's learn what is Ettercap. So open up a terminal, type in manual and then type in Ettercap hit enter. So it says that Ettercap is a multi-purpose sniffer or content filter for the man in the middle attacks. So basically it allows you to become a man in the middle and then you can spoof or sniff all of the packets on a particular subnet host. So basically you can get important data out of this Ettercap sniffer. There are a few things that we should know at the start of this Ettercap. So, you have this option which says sniffing at startup you can turn it on turn it off based upon your preferences and then you're going to choose the interface on which you're going to start the sniffing now just like every other tool in Kali Linux you need to identify or decide the interface on which you're going to start so I have different options you have eth0 local loopback local loopback is actually used for a bridged interface then I have connected an external adapter to my device which is over here which is on WLAN 0. Well if you are going to use this network which is an external adapter then you need to turn on the monitoring mode on this WLAN 0. And then you can even go for a Bluetooth Linux monitor but I am just going to go with H0. And then you have this option for bridge sniffing. If you want to turn on the local loopback interface then you need to turn this bridge sniffing on. But since I am only going with H0 so I can simply click on this tiny little tick box to go with these settings. Now that starts up the adder cap. Now how to actually provide a target for editor cap to scan. For this I am going to press ctrl and alt so I get out of my virtual machine to my host machine which is a windows 10 and in here I am going to press windows type in cmd and in here I am going to type in ip configure and on my main machine I am connected to wi-fi network. So this is the ip address of my wi-fi interface which is 192.168.18.13 
.18.1 would be my default gateway. So I'm going to keep this in my mind because this is going to be my target. Once that is done, I'm going to simply click on this button which is for the host. Now currently it won't show you any host or it might show you a single host. But you want to search for all the 255 subnets on your default gateway to find all the up host. So for that simply click on this search icon that is going to scan for all the 255 host on your network. Now after clicking the scan button you can see that it has discovered 4 of the host one of which is going to be my default host which is this one 192.168.18.1 and this is the host of my computer machine on which I am running this virtual machine. There are multiple options that you are going to go with and if on the startup page you have not selected start sniffing on startup then you would need to click on this button which is to start and stop sniffing to start the sniffing and then what you are going to do is that you can add in the target right click and add to target 1 and then you can select another target for target 2 if you want to snap that target as well but what I am going to do is that I am going to select my default gateway as target and add it to target 2 you can even view the target list for example simply click on these three dots click on targets and click on select targets and with this you can add in manual targets depending upon your MAC address, IP address, IPv6 address and the port number. Now this is also useful because some of the times certain machines are set to be hidden. For that you can use this one. And then you can go on targets and choose current targets to view that your targets have been added to the target list. Once that is done you need to start ARP spoofing. So simply click on this globe icon which is for man in the middle menu and from here you have different options but in this course we are just going to talk about ARP poisoning. So start the ARP poisoning and optional parameters you are going to select sniff remote connections then start ok. Now you are poisoning the network or the whole subnet with random ARP poisoning. To view this we are going to simply click on this and search for Wireshark. And then we are going to select at 0 the same interface that we have used for adder cap and start the capturing mode. Now we can see that we have a lot of information going on and we have our main host or target over here as well. So we are not only totally being the man in the middle and reading every packet that is going from our default host or default gateway to our targeted host. We are also even poisoning the network so that we cannot be detected. Now the benefit of this is that if the target host visits a website and types in his credentials you would be able to see his credentials right over here. So that is how you can work with the man in the middle attack using Ettercap. But there is one thing that you should know most of the browsers or the newer operating system are wary of this Ettercap or ARP poisoning so they might be protected. So in this video we are going to talk about how to crack the passwords of compressed file whether it may be RAR file or zip file in Kali Linux with the help of John the Ripper. Now John the Ripper is a software that is most commonly used to crack down weak password. So simply come over here and type in John and then hit enter. Now you would see that John is also a command line tool. It does not have a graphical user interface. So we can head over to the manual by typing in manuals followed up by John. And then hit enter. Now in the name we find something interesting. It says that John is a tool to find weak passwords of your users. Whereas I said that we are going to be using John to find the password of compressed files. Well that is also true. We can find the password of Linux users with the help of John by going over to the shadows file in the etc directory which is used to contain the passwords of users. We can crack that file with the help of John as well but we are now concerned with only finding the passwords of compressed files. Now as you can see on my desktop that I have these two files. The first file is rar.test.rar and zip.test.zip. So what I did was I created these files on my main operating system which is running a windows operating system and I've just copied them within this virtual machine by dragging it over from my windows to my virtual machine. So I have these two different compressed files compressed on different formatting. Now John the Ripper can be used to decrypt the password regardless of the formatting of the compression. So what I'm going to do is that since these files are on the desktop I'm going to open up a terminal on the desktop. So as you can see that the present working directory is desktop, we can just confirm it with the pwd command. So it is very necessary to be on the same folder in which you have the files that you want to crack. Now before beginning to crack, we should know about a few things. So the first thing is 
password hashes now each individual password of each individual file would have a certain hash now that hash is what we require to crack that password now john the ripper actually has its own tool that is used to find out this hash of a particular formatted compressed file for example this zip file has the tool zip to john and the rar file has the tool rar to john so the first step would be to figure out the hashes of these individual compressed files and then we are going to use the john or john the ripper to use that hash file and figure out the password for this particular compressed file so let's begin so as i mentioned we need to find the hash so we're going to start with this zip file first so we're going to type in zip to john followed up by the name of the zip file which is zip test.zip and then we are going to simply hit enter now as you can see on the terminal there are a few things it tells us an error that compressed length of AES entry is too short or it may even show you some any other error. But we are not concerned with that, we are only concerned with the hash. Now the hash starts with a dollar sign and ends on a dollar sign as well. And this is the document within that zip file. So this is our hash. So now there are two methods of utilizing this hash. You can either copy it. And then when we are using the john command you can paste it in the field where it is required or the much professional way is that you're going to simply export this hash in an external file now we know how to do that so zip to john zip test dot zip and then to export it we have the greater than symbol followed up by the name of the file on which we want to export so i'm just going to type it as zip hash and make sure to type the format as txt because when we are using john the ripper we need to have the file as the txt format now simply hit enter and you can see on the desktop we have created a new file with the name ziphash.txt and if you open it up it does not contain any error rather it only contains the hash so now we can use the john command so the command is john and the first parameter is actually double hyphen format so we need to specify the format of the compressed file that we are going to crack so the format was zip followed up by the hash now you can paste in the selection of hash which we did right over here or we can simply forward in the file in which we contain the hash so zip hash dot txt well the, if this file is not in the same present working directory then you need to pass in the complete path to this file once that is done simply hit enter and wait for the scan or the cracking process to complete now remember i have given it a very weak password and within a few seconds it actually cracked that password and the password is 1234 now the reason that i have given it a very weak password is that most of the time the stronger the password the longer it is going to take to crack it does not mean that it cannot be cracked because no security and no password is impenetrable but it takes a longer time to crack so that is why if a password contains special characters alphabets numbers and a longer length it would take quite a lot of time to crack whereas in this short video i'm only going to explain you how to use john the ripper to crack passwords so it tells us that okay from the hash that you provided and for the format that you selected this should be the password so let's test it out so the password it says is one two three four so open up this file and then we are going to simply try to extract it and it asks us for the pass so we are going to provide the password as one two three four and then click on ok and actually that was the password and we were able to extract the document from within that compressed file now in case you want to crack this rar file what you're going to do is that instead of zip to john you're simply going to use rar to john and when you're using the john command so the format argument is not going to be zip it is actually going to be rar and then followed up by the same procedure so that is going to allow you to crack the password of this rar file well that is how you can use the john the ripper to crack the password of compressed files so in the previous video we used john the ripper to find the passwords of our compressed files but as we saw in the previous video in the manual page it says that it is used to find the weak passwords of your users but we were not finding the passwords or cracking the password of users so how do we do that before we actually try to crack the password of linux users we must know where are the passwords placed so if i do the simply cat command which is to take the items out of a file and print it onto the terminal then in the etc directory there is a file named as password now this file usually contains the password of all the services and some of the passwords of the users added to it but this is a trick in linux operating system the actual passwords are not contained into this file it is actually contained into this shadow file 
which not only contains the password but also the user names or the user logins and this file is encrypted so if i try opening it up it is going to tell me that the permission was denied so i can run sudo and then cat and then etc and then shadow so type in the password for my main root account which is kali and then we have all of these passwords but even in this file i cannot actually decrypt the file because all of these passwords are written in an encrypted form and like we saw in the previous video this term starting from dollar sign ending on another dollar sign is usually known as the password hash so we can use john the ripper with this password hash to crack this password now how do we do that it's really simple so i'm just going to open up a new terminal and i'm going to shift over to the root user by typing in the command sudo i and typing in the password as kali and then in the root user i'm simply going to type in john and then i'm going to point the john to the encrypted file which is going to be etc and shadow now this is the command that might work for the most of you but sometimes you might get this error that we are trying to use the default input encoding utf8 but no password hashes were loaded now this is because this etc.shadow file has a specific encryption so you need to provide that specific encryption within the format flag just like we did with the rar files so we simply type in format is equals to crypt so this crypt is actually the default encryption of the shadow file once we do that it is going to go through that file decrypt the passwords and show it on to this terminal but as you can see that it says loaded three password hashes with three different salts crypt generic password tricks and stuff like that basically i had run this john command previously so it does not want to scan or re-decrypt the password so what we're going to do is that we're going to add in a new user with the command user add and then space hyphen r and then we're going to type a name for the user it's going to be user 9 and then hit enter so now we have successfully added a new linux user in our operating machine now we want to provide it with a password so simply type in the command password then followed up by the username which is going to be user 9 and then hit enter then it is going to ask you for the password so right now i'm going to provide a very simple password it is going to be one two three four five six seven eight nine so retype that password now i've given it a very simple password just like in the previous video the reason is the same that a simpler password is going to take less time to crack well we can give a stronger password but that would take a lot of time to crack now what we can do is that we can simply go with john etc shadow double hyphen format is equals to crypt and then hit enter now this time around since it has not previously cracked this user password for user number nine so it is going to go over this file and crack the password for this specific user which was not previously cracked so it says that it loaded four passwords out of which three of it it had previously cracked so remaining was one password hash so now here you can see the username and the password for that username so that is how you can crack that password now we have learned how to crack the passwords of the users which were not previously cracked but we want to view the passwords which were previously cracked as well so we can do that simply by typing in john then pointing it to the shadow file and then using a flag which is double hyphen show and then hit enter now it is going to show us the previously cracked usernames and passwords so even the root user was cracked so kali and kali was the root user then user 1 user 2 and then the user 9 which we have added at the last so that is how you can use john the ripper to crack down the passwords of linux users now in this video we are going to talk about hashcat and how to crack the passwords for zips and rars using hashcat now first of all you might be wondering that we have already learned how to crack the passwords for zips and rars using john the ripper so why do we even need to learn hashcat well the logic is pretty simple sometimes john the ripper fails to crack the password of certain format just for an example if the end user has used rar5 to actually create that rar file then john the ripper might run into some kind of error for example let me open up and let me redo the procedure for john the ripper so kali the step was rar to john hashcat test dot rar and then i'm going to output this to hash dot txt that is done and then what i'm going to do is john format rar and then hash dot txt and then hit enter now even though everything is correct even though the format is correct we get this error using default input encoding utf8 no password hash is loaded even though the password hash is actually right over here so this is kind of a bug with john the ripper but this only occurs when you are using a rar5 to create a rar file so 
In this particular situation, there is another software Hashcat that comes into play. So simply come over to Linux logo, search for Hashcat and you would open up this terminal with all the list of commands and different options that you can use with Hashcat. And as you can already see, there are quite a lot of different options and commands. If we scroll to the very top, we can see the usage of Hashcat. So you start with the keyword Hashcat and then you follow it up with different options. Then you provide the hash or hash file and then you follow it up with the dictionary, the mask or directory. Basically, the Hashcat uses different types of attack modes and then you even define the type of the format of the file that you're trying to crack or the hash that you're trying to crack using this M flag which stands for mod and then you need to pass in a dictionary which contains a list of a word list of passwords or a mask which does the same and you can even actually choose the attack mode. So if you scroll down, these are all the different formats or encryptions that can be cracked with the help of Hashcat and there are quite a lot of different types of formats including the new ones. And if we go beneath that, you would see the attack modes written over here. So we have the straight attack mode, combination attack mode, brute force, hybrid word list plus mask, hybrid mask plus word list and association. We are not going to cover all of these, we are just going to know how to use a basic hashcat command to actually decrypt rr5 file. The very first thing that we need to do is that we need to make sure that the default word list in the Kali Linux is extracted. Now open up file system. You can even do this with the terminal. So what you're going to do, you're going to head inside user, you're going to head inside share, search for word list and there you would see this rockyou.txt.gz file. So this is basically an extracted file and then you're going to extract the txt from within which is rockyou.txt. You might need sudo privileges to do this so you already know how to do that so I'm not going to cover that over here. After that, simply open up a terminal, head over to the root user cd to the desktop and then we again need the hash of this rar file. Now for the hash, we are going to use the john the ripper tool which is rar to john and get the hash to a text document. And if we open up this text document, so as you can see the name of the original rar file has been appended before the hash. So what we are going to do is that we don't need this rar file name so we are going to remove that and we are going to leave only the hash and then we are going to click on files, save as and save it in a new file, let's just call it hashes.txt. After that, we are going to crack this file. So the command is hashcat followed up by attack mode A, which I, we can go with the default one, which is zero. So writing it or not writing it is the same thing, but we do need to specify the mode of the extension that we are going to crack. So again, search for hashcat and then you're going to search the mods for rar or in precise rar5 which is right over here and the mode is 13000. So come back over here type the mode as 13000 and then the file which contains our hash which is hashes.txt and then the path to the rockyou.txt which was in the word list which you had extracted. So usr space share word list rockyou.txt. Now this word list.txt contains thousands of passwords which we are going to test against our rar file. After that you are going to simply hit enter and wait for the process to complete. Now it might take a little while but as soon as the password is found, the password is going to be written right over here. So it says that the password is password123. So open up our RAR file, try to extract the data and type in the password as password123 and then hit OK. And just like that we were able to successfully crack the password of our RAR5 file using hashcat. Now in the same way, you can crack the password for zip files. So you would have to type in hashcat and followed up by hyphen m. And if it is a zip2, then the mode should be 13600. With that, you're going to follow the same steps and you would be able to find the password for your zip files as well. So take a look at the manual of hashcat to find more details about hashcat. But that brings us to the end of this video. So in this video, we are going to talk about Wi-Fi pen testing with the help of Air Tools. Now in Linux, if you head over here and go to the 5th tab, if you head over to the 6th tab, you can see this application named as aircrack-ng. Air now this can be used to crack WEP passwords, just like it says you can use it to key crack WPA-PSK and WEP passwords, but it can also be used to crack WPA2 passwords. Now the only thing is that. 
you need to use multiple air tools in combination with each other to crack the password or to pen test your Wi-Fi network. And then there is another additional thing that you want to know. If you have installed Kali Linux on a virtual machine, then you need to connect an external adapter to your PC. And when you do that, you will see this dialog box pop up. So what you're going to do is that you're going to click on connect to a virtual machine and then choose the Kali Linux virtual machine, click on OK. Now if you come over to this network option, you can see that we have Wi-Fi network available as well because we have plugged in an external Wi-Fi adapter. But if you are running a live version of Kali Linux, then you do not need to worry about external adapters. You can go with the internal adapters as well. Now the pen testing that we are going to apply actually depends upon four different tools. The first one, as we have already mentioned, is Aircrack NG. So we can open up the help bar over here. The second one is actually Airmon-NG. Now this Airmon command is used to enable the monitor mode on an external adapter. And this requires the root privileges. So make sure to head over to the root user and then type in the command Airmon-NG and then you can visit the help. After that, we need another air tool which is Arrow Dump. So Arrow Dump hyphen ng and then help and the last air tool that we are going to be requiring is air replay now each one of these tools has a specific role so we are going to start with airmon to turn on the monitoring mode on our external wi-fi adapter and then we are going to come over to error dump and then we are going to check the connections or the handshakes upon a particular bss id now bss id stands for basic service set identification Every Wi-Fi router has a specific BSS ID. So what we're going to do is that we're going to use Air Replay to launch a deauthorization attack on that Wi-Fi router using its BSS ID. And then we are going to basically disconnect all of the devices that are connected to that Wi-Fi router. Once that is done, those devices are going to try to connect to it again. And when they try to connect to it again, we are going to capture the handshake using Arrow Dump. Now, once we have the handshake with Arrow Dump, we are going to come over to air crack and then we are going to simply crack that handshake with the help of a brute force attack or with some other kind of dictionary attack. So let's get started. So first of all, open up a terminal and type in iwconfig. Now this is going to show you the configuration of all the network adapters connected to your virtual machine. Now we are only concerned with this one which is WLAN 0. Now it is not in the monitoring mode. So we need to change this mode from manage to monitor because with monitor mode, we can send out packets to different devices and even to the Wi-Fi router. Now to do this, we need to type in the command airmon. But before that, let's move over to the root user, type in Kali as the password, airmon-ng. And then there is a command which we can see from the help command that we can check for the particular process IDs which might stop our monitoring mode. So the command is airmon-ng check kill. Now this is not only going to check for the process IDs but it is going to kill them as well. Now as you can see that this process ID was disturbing our monitor mode. So this now has been killed. And one more thing when you actually execute this command you can see in the right corner that our network has been disconnected because the network service is disabled when you execute this command. After that we are going to start the monitor mode with the command airmon-ng start and then we are going to type in the name of our interface which is wlan0 wlan0 and then hit enter and now it is going to convert this mod from manage to monitor we can actually confirm this by typing in iwconfig and then hitting enter so now instead of wlan0 we have the interface name as wlan0 followed up by mon meaning that it is in monitor mode which we can confirm from right over here as explained before we are going to use arrow dump tool to monitor all of the BSS IDs with this WLAN 0 mon. So the command is arrow dump hyphen ng followed up by our interface which is WLAN 0 mon. So now as you can see that these are all of the BSS IDs of the Wi-Fi routers that are available to my external Wi-Fi adapter. So I can simply press ctrl c to stop this monitoring scan with arrow dump. And this is the particular one that we are going to apply pen testing on. So we are going to simply copy this BSS ID of this Wi-Fi router. And one more thing is that we are also going to take notice of the channel on which it is running because knowing the channel actually makes our testing run quite faster. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to look for a handshake on this particular BSS ID. So the command is arrow dump hyphen ng followed up by the interface which is WLAN0mon 
followed up by the channel. So we're going to specify the channel at 6 with the help of hyphen C flag. And then we're going to add in the flag for BSS ID, which is double hyphen BSS ID. And then we're going to simply press Ctrl Shift V to paste in the BSS ID. This time around, it is not even going to bother to monitor the other BSS IDs. So we can actually confirm this by simply hitting enter. As you can see that now it is only monitoring this one particular BSS ID and it tells us that six devices are connected to this particular BSS ID. Now when we have found their handshake, we want to store it inside a particular file so that we can access that file with the help of aircrack. For that, simply close down the execution of arrow dump, reuse the last command but add in the flag hyphen w which would actually export the handshake to a particular file. And then I have made this folder on the desktop named as pent. So I am going to export that file in this folder. So the path is home slash kali slash desktop slash pent and then I'm going to name the file as handshake and then hit enter. Now it is monitoring this particular BSS ID for a particular handshake and when the handshake is found it is going to store that handshake within these file which have been now created. Now to force a four way handshake we are going to open up a new terminal move over to the root user and this time around we are going to use the air replay tool so air replay hyphen ng and in here you can see so here you can see that we want to run this deauthorization attack and we also want to specify the bss id which is hyphen b so the command is air replay hyphen ng double hyphen deauth and then zero now this zero is going to mean that it is going to continue attacking for an infinite number of time followed up by hyphen a now this is going to specify our target the target is going to be our bss id so simply paste that in followed up by the interface which is wlan0 monitor and then hit enter now as soon as we start that attack the devices connected to it are going to be disconnected and once they try to reconnect to it we are going to see a golden handshake right over here just like that now we can stop our deauthorization attack once that is done the last step is to actually run aircrack ng so i'm going to open up my folder and then run aircrack ng from within this folder so open up a terminal right over here and the reason for opening the terminal within this folder is because that handshake files are now placed in within this folder so if i simply type in ls we can see all of these different handshake files and then there is also this file which is list.txt so basically I went inside user share word list open up this rockq.txt which we have used in the previous video as a dictionary now this dictionary contains thousands of different possible passwords so i shortened the list so that my pen testing takes quite lesser time and i've also included the actual password just to showcase you that it can actually work with the possibility of different dictionaries there are a number of publicly available dictionaries that you can use for free so now to use the aircrack command simply type in aircrack hyphen ng follow it up with hyphen w this hyphen w is going to specify the dictionary so the dictionary is list.txt within this pent folder and then you follow it up with the handshake file now as you can see in the ls command that there are multiple variants of the handshake file because this error dump command actually provides the handshake file in different formats so we have csv dot net xml and then dot cap so we are going to be using this dot cap file so you type in the name handshake hyphen zero one dot cap and then simply hit enter and wait for the air crack to figure out the right key from the dictionary now since we were using a pretty short list of dictionary so that is why it was able to find that in within mere seconds now this is the key belonging to our wi-fi router now there is still one thing left we still don't have network services running on our linux operating system now we need to fix that as well so the very first step is to open up a new terminal type in iwconfig and we can see that our external wi-fi adapter is still in the monitoring mode so we need to stop the monitoring mode so the command is airmon hyphen ng stop wlan zero mon and then hit enter we need to run it as the root user and just like that now it is not in the monitoring mode we can confirm it with the command iwconfigure and then we also need to start the network services so the command for that is service space network hyphen manager space start 
Now in case that command does not work for you, you can also use this command which is systemctl space start space network manager and then hit enter. Now that is going to start up your network manager. And after a few seconds, you should see network working right over here. Now we are going to test out this key. So go over to Wi-Fi networks, find the Wi-Fi server on which we have applied pen testing. Now it is asking us for the key. So we are going to copy the key from here, paste it over here and then click on connect. And now as you can see under Wi-Fi networks that we are connected to the targeted host. So that is how you can perform Wi-Fi pen testing with the help of aircrack-ng and all of its other tools. So by far in this course, we have talked about network monitoring, network scanning, password cracking, Wi-Fi pen testing and so much more. And in this last section, we are going to be talking about information gathering using the Kali Linux operating system. Now information gathering can be as simple as reconnaissance which we have talked about in the previous videos. But there are specific tools in Kali operating system that are specifically made for a single or like two or three purposes. In this section, we are going to go over some of those tools. And if I talk about those tools namely, they include NetDiscover, Multigo, Recon, DSN, Num, DNS Recon, Sparta and there are a thousands of other softwares like that. And I've mentioned Nmap in there as well. So Nmap can also be used for simple information gathering. Basically, in Kali operating system, there are multiple tools that can perform the same operation. So knowing different tools can help you actually excel at a particular task with the knowledge of using multiple tools. Just like we used John the Ripper and Hashcat to do exactly the same thing. So the very first tool that we're going to use in this section is going to be NetDiscover. So if I open up my Kali application and search for NetDiscover, you would see that this opens up a terminal, meaning that this is a command line tool and does not have a graphical user interface. Now this NetDiscover tool is a very basic tool and it serves a very simple purpose. It is used to scan a network for the up host, so the hosts that are currently alive. The usage of NetDiscover is also pretty straightforward. So you simply provide the command NetDiscover followed up with hyphen i which is also optional because this hyphen i as you have used this flag and different other tools stands for the interface which we are going to use to scan or to monitor some other stuff. So this flag is optional in this NetDiscover tool but it is a good practice to actually specify the interface that you are going to use and then we have other kind of flags. So the most important ones that we are going to talk about are these three first flags. Hyphen I is used to specify your interface. Hyphen R is used to specify a specific range of internet protocols or IPs that you want to scan for. And then hyphen L actually takes in a file which contains the range or a specific IP. And then that range or that specific IT is searched through the network. So let's start using this. So the command is net discover followed up by hyphen I and then we need to provide the interface. Now as we have used the interface multiple times in the previous video, so if I open up IW configure, the current interfaces are eth0 and I've disconnected my external adapter from the previous section so that is why WLAN0 is not showing over here. So I'm going to be using eth0. So I'm going to specify that right over here and then I'm going to start an automatic scan. So if you're not providing any range, then that means that NetDiscover is going to use the interface, use the default IP address to deduce the default gateway and then it is going to use the default gateway to search all of the subnets for the hosts that are currently alive on that network which is also called an auto scan. So you can start an auto scan and just like that it says that you should be a root user so simply type in sudo hyphen i and you can rerun the command so NetDiscover hyphen i and then at zero. So this opens up this page which is going to scan all of the subnets so as you can see over here. This is the current IP address which is being scanned. So this 192.168.1 which has shown up at the very first is actually our default gateway. It shows you the MAC address of that machine. Now MAC addresses are specific to specific machines and then the length and then the MAC vendor or the actual developer of that particular machine. So from this one we can see that this is our Wi-Fi router and the default gateway. And then we have these hosts. Now there is an interesting thing if I open up my terminal and type in if configure, 
you can see my IP address is 192.168.18.25. However, in this NetDiscover, I do not see the IP address ending at .25. That is because the NetDiscover is going to simply ignore the IP address of the Kali Virtual Machine, which is the host of this NetDiscover command. Anyways, that is how to use the automatic scan we're using the NetDiscover. Now you can stop the scan with the help of Ctrl plus C. So next up is going to be the manual scan. So the manual scan can be used for to search for a particular IP address on the network or it can be used to search for a particular IP range on the network. So the command is netdiscover and then you can specify the interface but again that is not necessary as it is going to use your default interface. So I can just remove this flag and type in hyphen r which is going to specify an IP range. So I'm going to type in the range as 192.168.18.0 24. So that is going to be my default gateway up to the maximum limit of the subnets which is 255 and then hit enter. So this time around I have specified the total number of frames that it is going to scan. Doing this you can clearly see that this was much faster than the automatic scan because the automatic scan was looking for different default gateways as well. And then it says that the scanning is finished so if you want to quit this network discovery then you can simply type in control plus C. And the last thing is network discover hyphen L and hyphen L takes in a file which contains the list of IPs. On the desktop, I'm going to create a new document. So I'm going to use a touch command and I'm going to create a file which is going to be ip.txt and then hit enter. After that, I'm going to open up this text file and in here I'm going to specify the range. So 192.168 dot 18 dot 0 slash 24 and let's also search for another range 192 dot 168 dot let's just go with 13 dot 0 slash 24 even though this second line is not going to yield any results because this does not even exist on our network but still it would be a good test so save that file and close it and then after the hyphen l flag i'm going to paste in the whole path to this file which is slash home slash Kali slash desktop slash IP dot txt and then hit enter and actually the flag for file was not hyphen F it was hyphen L so do that and then hit enter so now it is going to read that txt file remember it should always be at the txt file and then it is going to scan the IP ranges placed in that file and we get the similar result to automatic and manual scan. So that is how you can use net discovery tool for reconnaissance of the network that you're currently working in. Now at the end, I would like to add that always before using a tool, always try to look up for the manual. So simply type in net discover and then hit enter. In the name, it says that it is an active or passive ARP reconnaissance tool. So it is only used for reconnaissance, which is basically information gathering. And then you have options and stuff like that. And also, just like in the starting videos, I have shown you how to use this Mozilla Firefox to actually come to this web default homepage from where you can find out about the tools installed in your Kali Linux. So net discover, open it up and you would be brought to the official documentation by Kali.org on net discover tool. Whichever tool that you're working with, make sure that you check out these two manuals because these two documentations can give you a much more detailed overview or an insight about the tool that you're going to use. So in this video, we're going to talk about finding information or information gathering about a particular DNS record. Now, I've not used the term DNS, but I've used the term DNS records. So those of you who are familiar with DNS records might know that a DNS have multiple different parts. So if I open up my Mozilla Firefox, so you can simply search for what is a DNS record and you would most likely come across these terms. So a DNS can have multiple types of records. A record is nothing but a field with some information inside it. So the A record or the single A record is the record that holds the IP address of the domain. A quad A record is the record that contains the IPv6 address of the domain. Similarly, CNAME forwards one domain or subdomains to another domain. Basically, it contains the list of all the subdomains. MX record basically contains the list of email servers of that particular domain and so much more. You can learn this about by simply searching for what are the types of DNS records. 
Now we are going to get the information about a particular website and we are going to be focusing on getting the information about different types of DNS records. So there are three different tools in Kali Linux that come as pre-installed. The first is known as the host. So the host tool is actually pretty easy to use. So simply type in the keyword host, follow it up by hyphen T and then you type in what is the record that you want to find. So if I wanted to find the IPv4 address of my domain, I would simply type in a single A as it was a single A record and then follow it up with the domain. So I'm going to go with the google.com domain. So type that in and hit enter. It is going to take a few seconds and then it is going to get you the IPv4 address. Similarly, if I want the IPv6 address, I'm going to type in host space hyphen T followed up by a quad A and then google.com which is my targeted domain. Now that is going to give us IPv6. Similarly, if I want to get the subdomains, I would simply type in host space hyphen T CNAME which was the name of the record followed up by my targeted domain which in this case is google.com. Now this is where this host tool comes at a downfall. This is saying that google.com does not have a CNAME record which is not true. So therefore another tool comes into play which is the DNS enum. Now this DNS enum can also be found in the Kali information gathering and DNS analysis. Here you see DNS enum, DNS recon and fears. So we are just concerned with DNS enum. So DNS enum has a lot of different flags as well. But for now we are just going to be focusing on DNS enumeration. So you type in DNS enum followed up with a double flag and enum which is the flag for enumeration. And then we can simply type in our targeted domain which is google.com and then we can simply hit enter. Now as you can see that it is going over all of the records of google.com and trying to find all of the information. So if I go up, it started with host address which is the A record and the IPv4 address. Then we found out the different name servers right over here. Then it even found out different mail servers which is the MX record. And then it and then it even searched for trying zone transfer a getting bind version which we cannot do in the host tool. And then it even scrapped google.com for different subdomains. After that these are all of the subdomains of google.com and this cnum tag actually identifies that it does contain a cnum record which the host tool failed to identify. Now this is going to go on for a quite a lot of time so I'm just going to stop it so that I can move on to the next tool. And the next tool is DNS Recon. Now DNS Recon actually works the same. It gathers information about the DNS records of a particular targeted domain. So it's really easy to use. Simply type in DNS Recon followed up by the hyphen D flag. Let's actually go with hyphen H flag so that we can view all of the different flags that we can use or all of the different parameters that we can use. So we are only concerned with this one hyphen D which allows us to specify the targeted domain or the domain from which we want to gather information. So DNS recon space hyphen D followed up by google.com and then simply hit enter. Now this is all of the information the starting value or the prefix is actually the record name. So in total it found out 38 records. Now DNS recon is slightly faster than DNS enum. So we have SOA, NS, MX, mail servers, A record, IPv6, IPv4 and all the other records of the google.com domain. So that is how you can gather information about a particular domain name server and all of the records that that server contains using host, DNS enum and then lastly DNS recon. Now with all of those videos done, that brings us to the end of this course. Now this course was not an introduction to pen testing or ethical hacking or anything like that. This was your first stepping stone into the Kali Linux operating system. With this course you have gathered information about reconnaissance, basic simple cracking, WEP, pen testing and other stuff down the line. Now if you talk about tools then there are thousands of tools available for Kali Linux operating system. So make sure to practice these tools that are mentioned in this application bar and even after that there are thousands of other tools that are not installed by default in the Kali Linux operating system. So make sure to install them, not all of them, but the ones that you actually need depending upon the field that you want to step in. For example, you can go into pen testing, you can go into social engineering pen testing, you can go into web pen testing and other fields as well. You can go into Android pen testing. But the thing is that make sure to check out the tools that help you in your field. 
and whenever you're working with a tool make sure to open up the terminal and make sure to check for the manuals and then make sure to check out the manuals from the tools official website and from the Kali Linux official website and with that I would like to wish all of you good luck in your Kali Linux journey and I hope to see you in other courses of ours.